It's a wonderful morning and hopefully the rain will hold off um, so we can have our services out here this morning. Uh, I am here this morning with a heavy heart to let you know that Pastor Paul is going to be resigning. His last day with us is August 16th, next Sunday. He has guided us through the MET process and he has helped our saviors share our ideas and thoughts with each other. We are now at the call committee process. We thank him for his work he has done with us. We wish him well as he continues to use his ministry and gifts with others. So we thank him for his time and next Sunday will be his last sermon with us. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Arlene is the council president. And really, if you have appreciation for the efforts and ministry of Pastor Paul, honk your horn and applaud. There is one announcement. Um, in the back of your messenger, there um, is a note about sending cards of, of comfort to the Stackinger family as well as to Simpson. And it is also with sadness that I say to you that Chuck Simpson passed away on Friday evening and uh, funeral services are pending at this time. So write a note to, of, of care to Carol and the family. So in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us begin worship with our opening hymn. God, our defender, storms rage around and within us and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and persevere us in the faith of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first 
reading today is from the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with new, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free. But Christ is all and in all. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 85 responsively. I will listen to what the Lord God is saying. For you speak peace to your faithful people and to those who turn their hearts to you. Truly, your salvation is very near to those who fear you that your glory may dwell in our hell. Steadfast love and faithfulness have met together. Righteous and peace have kissed each other. Faithfulness shall spring up from the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. The Lord will indeed grant prosperity and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness shall go before the Lord and shall prepare for God a pathway. Amen. The Holy Gospel is from the 14th chapter of St. Uh, Matthew's Gospel, beginning with verse 22. Uh, it's about the storm that we just sang about a moment ago. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of, uh, to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds where he had been talking. After he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain all by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there all alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. Then early in the morning, he came, walking toward them on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them. He said, take heart, it's me. Don't be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if that is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he began walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But then he noticed the strong wind and became frightened once more and began to sing, crying out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him, saying, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind stopped. And those in the boat worshiped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Holy Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord. 
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. It's only once in a while when a gospel lesson really hits the nail on the head of the situation that you and I are living in and are uh, uh, having the forefront of our thinking all through the week. It's about being in the middle of a storm that's terrifying us, or at least making us a bit uneasy, harder to sleep, and a little bit more anxious than usual, if not downright terrified to the depths of our hearts. Because even people we know, perhaps, have been struck down by the virus. And in listening to the news, we find, uh, despite all of our technology and wisdom as human beings, the virus still is not under our control. Just like the winds were not under the disciples' control when the waves raged around them and threatened even their the little ship, the little, the little boat that they were on. This image of being in a small boat being battered by big winds, it's kind of like that for uh, many of us, many people all around the world these days. And in our gospel story this morning, we've got, uh, we've got Jesus coming and giving us a beautiful picture of what it's probably like for all of us in this dilemma of having all of these forces in the mix with all of the good and the beauty of life that frighten us, that threaten to pull the rug out from under the good that we're enjoying. And at times, all of the evil and the bad and the threats become much larger than what we perceive of the goods and the beauties and the blessings. And we become frightened. We can't sleep. But we're drinking more than we usually drink in order to find the calm place, some peace in our life, or some pleasure. Because it seems most of them have disappeared because we can't get together with our friends in the way we used to and experience the closeness and the love that God's given us in them. Well, Jesus had a solution that he says he has available to everyone. And he's saying, come to everyone. Remember his frustration all through his ministry. Jesus would be inviting people to a feast. He was the one who could relieve their thirst, who could meet their needs for being fed and their souls being kept safe being given a sense of how valuable and special and important they were. And it was like coming to a party, Jesus says, when you come into the kingdom of God, because it's the reign of love. He's been saying, come, come, follow my way, and you will find a place of peace, or in this case, in the boat, you'll find the buoyancy to be on top of the waves. Jesus never promised to get rid of the waves and the wind. That's why he gave us all these examples of Jesus being in the middle of the worst of what the world has to throw at you. The final threat he had was on the cross and the power that the officials had to manhandle him, to beat him, to spit on him, make fun of him and put him on the cross. It looked like God has no power at all, but he endured the consequences of all of the things that frighten us most, even our dying letting go of our human life, he endured it all as a, as a model to us, a way of teaching us that even death is nothing to fear. It, like all the other bad things, are simply stepping stones into a deeper knowing of the whole truth. We are made in his image and we are alive forever. And the ultimate reality about our being is that we are spirits who have come from God and who are going to God. And in this journey that's a mixed bag where there is a whole lot of evil and there is a whole lot of good, he is available to our spirits to help us to know in our deepest parts that there is nothing ultimately to be afraid of. And that's what's in this story. One example of Jesus helping us to get a little bit more of a, of a grasp of and, and a peace from in this story about Peter, 
the disciples terrified on this wind-tossed boat. Well, they see, they see a figure coming to them walking on the water in the middle of this storm. And initially, what is the disciples' response to spirit reality? The, the spiritual being of Jesus uh, walking, and he still was embodied, but he was had buoyancy to walk on top of the water. They thought it was a ghost, and it frightened them. It frightened them. They knew it was Jesus, or thought it was Jesus, but it still scared them because it, it was a spirit-like creature. It wasn't the concrete humanness that they were used to. God's trying to teach us. We are both and. It's not either or. And he was an embodied spirit who had the full power of being a spirit who was the creator of the universe that he could pull off this trick. Although he couldn't teach it to the disciples except Peter because he did have the faith enough to get out of the boat and respond to Jesus saying, you get excited by the possibility of walking on water, of the buoyancy I get? Well, just come. And Peter got out of the boat. He was the only one who had enough faith and trust and perhaps just a, a stupid impulse but he's the one who jumped out of the boat. And he did it. He had a buoyancy somehow that enabled him to walk on top of the water and through the waves toward Jesus. And then what happened? Just like what happens for you and I. After we can have the, the, the deepest experiences in our heart and in our mind and soul of the wonder of God's love and his presence in our life, and then all of a sudden, what did Peter do? He looked more at the wind and the waves than he did at Jesus, and down he went. And I'm sure all of you have heard this story before and heard the lesson that God wants us to learn from it before. What we need to do is don't take your eyes off of Jesus. As soon as he did, it focused more on what's, what's scary and threatening and the powers in this physical realm. And you lose sight of who we are and what we have because of this mystery of the unseeable presence of God within us, when we lose sight of that, focus on that, and the flow of that into and through us, we lose our buoyancy, and down Peter went. So, the lesson is keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. The frustration? Yes, indeed. But, you can't blow our horns all the time because all too sadly, you and I, all too often, we move our focus more to the things that scare us in this world than on the reality of what it means that God and his resurrection power and his love and presence is a part of who we are. We lose sight of that and we go down. So the question is, what can we do to see Jesus when he's invisible. That's the dilemma, isn't it? The invisible God who, who says to Moses that if you look directly at me, when Moses wanted to see him face to face, God says, you see me face to face and you are toast, brother. <laughs> you can't experience the fullness of the glory and beauty and, and everything of God without letting go of your humanness. And you listen to anybody who's had a near-death experience that brought them into the light and the presence of God, they'll tell you how true that is. That they lose all their sense of fear, and they're overwhelmed with the immensity of what they've come to know on earth, but not as deeply. The love of God, the glory and the beauty of everything that's created by God. And they're overcome with peace and love with no ounce of fear in the mix. You can't experience the fullness of God's being without being out of your physical body. That's what's always in the mix and making it hard for us to keep the focus on the whole truth that's in Jesus, who's in us. And God knows that, so he keeps working with us gently but firmly to get us more confident about the realities of the whole truth about who we are and where we're going 
and what it means to have God as a part of our being inside. He was already helping his people to, to be aware of this mystery of his presence without seeing him directly. And how he put temple worship together for the old, old covenant people. Remember that? The temple, how it was structured? It had in a box in the Holy of Holies place, inside the box, maybe a box like this, only a little bit bigger from the, I don't know, the way it was showed in, in uh, um, Indiana Jones's uh, brief encounter with it, uh, a box a little bigger than this. And inside of the box were these concrete symbols of the times when the invisible God was visible or the effects of his presence was shown by Moses with this rod that divided the Red Sea. That rod was in there. When they were in the wilderness and they had nothing to eat, food was provided in this manna that was out there like, like a, a, a frost of snow. And they could gather it and nourish them. This manna was in that box. Another sign of God's presence without seeing him. They were the reminders of all the glory of God being with them and the reassurances. It was all this box. The Ten Commandments, the two tablets, they were in the box. But this was all put in the Holy of Holies, a place no one could go and look at these things, but they knew they were in there because they were simply helping the people to trust that the God we cannot see is real and he has been in our past in miraculous ways showing his power to protect us and to free us from bondage and slavery and to bring us to the promised land of milk and honey, something better. That was there in the Old Testament. That was the center of their worship place. And so they came to the temple as this place where God's presence came alive for them simply because they, they helped them remember the past when God did these super miraculous things to show his presence and his power and his love. Well, God was hoping that that would help them to trust him and to fall in love with him and to be his friends and reflectors of his glory to the world. But it didn't work out that way. The Israelites became more concerned about simply going to temple and feeling they paid their allegiance to God for the week and then went their way and did their own way and their own thing during the rest of the week. He says, you people worship me with your mouths, but your hearts are far from me. And so what God finally did, it took years till he got to this point, he destroyed the temple. He destroyed a whole lot of his people. He used the Babylonian king to do it, but he predicted it for many years. And it finally happened. Down the king, back down the temple went. And all of their holy relics disappeared. And all of God's people were saying, how in the world can we worship God without the holy temple? That's where his presence was. All of this was a setup, a stepping stone in the process of God revealing a greater fullness of his truth that came to us in Jesus. To help the world with his dilemma of dealing with the invisible God who nevertheless was the power and the force behind everything that existed and its purpose and its destination that all was in him and his love and his desire to extend and expand his beauty and goodness into all of the galaxies. So, where am I? Jesus came. After the temple was destroyed, the stage was set for God to come himself, embodied, looking like a human being. It was a step up. He still looked like a normal human being. But there he was, just like Kelly is there in front of me, a normal human being, coming as a little baby. And yet this was the unique human being that indeed had the fullness of the being of God. One of the Godhead was there in that human being, setting aside all of the extremes of his glory in order to help us understand that in every normal human being, there is still a fullness of glory and beauty and goodness that's a part of who they are, that centers in the living out of this flow of the Spirit of God being a part of who they are, 
and the fullness of God's beauty and goodness also being available for them to see and enjoy. That's what God was teaching in Jesus and why he came to be with us, to help us to replace the temple and then what happened on Pentecost after Jesus gave his final testimony to his own death and resurrection. Then at Pentecost, the new temple was identified. The new temple that was where? What building was it in this time? It was in no building except God started calling every human being a building. You are God's building, God said. You are my temple. You are the place where the, you are the holy hole of holies. Where the fullest degree of the glory and beauty and goodness of God resides. That's what God was hoping we'd all come to see and enjoy and be in awe over. And that's what I would suggest is where the buoyancy comes from. What Peter had for a while, had, the, had the, the, the courage and the desire to be with Jesus in being above the influence and the terror of the waves and, and the water. And he had it for a while with that focus on Jesus, just as all of us have had inklings of it now and then, but what God is hoping every day and every year of our lives, that more and more deeply we'll come to know, come to see and not lose sight of this wonder of who we are, whose we are, and what it means that the living being and spirit of Jesus is a part of who we are. And that we are living in the midst of a world surrounded, saturated with evidence of the glory and the goodness and the beauty of God. And, uh-oh, I wish the yellow flowers were all out here growing, but the flowers are dwindling down. There's still a few of them there. That's where Jesus said we should go and look. In terms of Jesus telling us how or where to worship and pray, what did he say? Well, here's what he said about where to go to pray. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, the Pharisees. They love to stand up and pray their, uh, uh, in their houses of worship so that everyone will see them and think they're superior. No. When you pray, go to your closet. That's the word the, the King James used. Go to your closet. And the modern translation says, go to your own room and shut the door and pray to your unseen father and your father who sees what you are doing will reward you. God's primary place for us to go for prayer and worship is not a building, is not the sanctuary. It is our closet or our room where we can shut the door and be alone. Jesus also taught us by his own example. Repeatedly through his whole account of his life with the disciples, he was leading them. He wasn't staying there to pray with them and to teach them how to pray much more than he did in the Lord's Prayer when they asked him right before he died uh, about a little bit more advice here about how to pray. But at, at another point, he made these clear statements about when you pray, the deepest experiences and potential you have for connecting with me in your deepest places is not going to be in a community or even in a family gathering around your tables around the Bible. It's going to happen when you get alone. Be still and know. Stop talking and know that I am God. Taste and see the Lord is good. Be aware of all of the glory and beauty of God when you're alone. I suspect that the majority of people sitting around you when you do go in the sanctuary or are in the sanctuary, like some of you are right now, that not many people sitting around you know the worst things about you. And until they knew, know, the depths of your oneness with them will be limited, shallow, superficial, 
Then you give them the appearance you want them to have, only the good stuff. Just as many people are able to do now at, with, with, with uh, uh, all the media that we've got available to us. God says, you need to get in contact with me when you're alone, and the depths of your worst can be connected with and wiped out by the awareness of the beauty and goodness of your being that we get when we're alone with our deepest worst open and available. Be alone for your prayer time, Jesus says, and you'll develop more buoyancy and be less afraid of the wind and the waves. Also, what was Jesus' example? Where did he go when he wanted prayer time? He went away from the disciples to be alone. He didn't go into a room, we're told. He always went to the garden of Gethsemane and often just into the hills, away from the disciples. He needed to be away for his best prayer time. It's not that what God was doing in the temple wasn't good and wasn't a part of what we need. It wasn't the whole and it wasn't enough to go deep enough to touch those places where our fears originate, to touch those and heal those and bring us more fully to peace and to, be a to a buoyancy that lifts us above the wind and the waves and the terror of their destructiveness. One of my first sermons here was a sermon I called in my mind, uh, Sleeping Through Sermons. I suggested that all of us all too often are sleeping through sermons, which came to my mind as I was looking at what do we need to do in order to maintain a buoyancy in the middle of all the winds and the waves. We need to, to give more time and attention and space, quiet space, to absorbing the awareness of the glory and power and, and goodness that's in creation that we so often are blind to. And in that sermon, I, I had a list of a couple simple things that had blown my mind and bring me to awe and delight those two keys to buoyancy. Oh, not a sense of what can I do to get rid of these threats, but the awe of what it means to have come from God and to be our, on our way to God and having his presence within us to relieve our fears and enable us to have peace at the top of the waves. It's awe and delight. Just what God was wanting those Israelites to have by telling them to do that crazy thing for Thanksgiving feast, of getting the best of their food, the best of their wine and drink, and enjoying it, enjoying the pleasures of God's creation with, connected with, their friends and loved ones in his presence. So that you're not just sitting down and having a good meal and saying, the key to our vitality and, and the best of life is simply being with each other. No, they're all going to die, and so are you. If you don't have your connections in the deepest places with Jesus and the wonder of God's love and, and, and the, the, the power of his goodness, uh, we're only part of the way there when we're enjoying the beauty and goodness one another at a party. It's time with Jesus, time in awe, time enjoying the wonders like our eardrums. Remember the truth about your eardrums? Uh, I didn't arrange for, for uh, Dave to play or, or Corey to play a, a C note, but you hit a C note and everybody is hearing that C note because their, their eardrums have fluttered 342 times a second. That's how you hear C. Now imagine hearing an orchestra with 18 different kinds of instruments accompanied by a choir with four di singing four different parts of the, of, of, of the tune, and you hear all of those different sounds, and you can pick them all up, but different parts of your eardrum are fluttering at different speeds in order to absorb those. It's mind-blowing. It's awesome. It's beautiful. It's beyond what any scientist can create an organ like that. 
or to create the DNA that could create that miracle and the miracle of what your stomachs do and the miracle of what your eyes do and we won't take the time to go through it. You know where I'm getting at. We need to get our minds blown and our hearts lifted to awe and wonder and delight at what it means to be the children of the living God. And unless until we do that, and only to the depth that we do that, in the quietness of alone time that we do that, will we find ourselves less vulnerable to the wind and the waves, less often pulled down into experiences of terror and high anxiety. So, I just wanted to give you a reminder. This is a great story to have on a day like this, in the middle of a time like this. The simple reminder that we can have things going a whole lot better if we just respond more often and more quickly to Jesus' invitation. Come to me, you that are laboring with heavy loads, and you will find rest for your souls. Learn from me, for I am humble and gentle and you will find life to its fullness. Maybe we all do it and find the wind and the waves not so scary. With and through Christ our Lord, let God's people beat their horns with an amen. confess together our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He descended to the center and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. We pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God the Father, our designer, Jesus the Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our energizer, keep you in their unity and their love forever and ever. Amen. Just love and